Good afternoon. It's been quite a wonderful uh, educational experience, hasn't it? My name is Robert Waters. I'm a medical doctor practicing in the Wisconsin Dells, and I've been doing nutritional practice for 30 years. And it's been uh, pretty exciting to see this field develop and to see so many more practitioners of all kinds come in and join this. And just today I met a number of MDs that are uh, sort of on the edge and ready to dive in and start what I call real medicine. Now this is a picture of uh, a forest and you can see all these colors and you might wonder why are those colors there? Is it just because they're beautiful? And I'm here to tell you those colors are there to protect the plant. And one of the themes of this lecture is going to be the need for us to eat food that has such pigments in it in order to have health because these pigments protect the plant and store energy for periods of time while the plant has too much energy to use. And so keep that in mind when you eat your food that it should have lots of colors. I hope to explain how we turn food into energy, which is basically the process of uh, not only ingesting food, but especially digesting it and distributing it all the way down uh, through the bloodstream into cells and into finally the most important organelle in this process, the mitochondrion. In this unit, we burn our calories in the presence of oxygen to make food for life processes. Now that's not actually a, an electron micrograph of a mitochondrion. They actually look uh, more like that. Whoops. Uh, more like that. And inside these little membranes, that, can people see that in the back? Good. Inside those little membranes sit all the enzymes that are required to break down glucose and fatty acids and go through various processes and finally uh, strip off the electrons and protons from the food substances to be used to make energy. And amazingly, these mitochondria represent about 10% of our body weight. Uh, they vary in number between maybe five per cell in the case of cartilage to up to 10,000 in the case of very metabolically active organs like the brain and muscle. Now here is a close up of the cell and I know this can be hard to read and we don't have a lot of time so I'm going to try to give an overview. What I'm trying to show here is on the extreme left you could see oxygen and food coming into the system via the lungs and via the digestive system and then delivered in this case to a stylized cell, the larger brown diagram. Up in the upper left you could see glucose molecules and the word insulin and inside there, and again hard to see, there's a glucose transporter. The center of metabolism is the transfer of glucose into cells at, with, at the, uh, with the help of insulin after which the sugar migrates and is carried into the central unit there called the mitochondrion. Now people wonder what are all these vitamins and minerals about? You hear things like B6 is good for carpal tunnel or B12 is good for your brain. The truth is all of these vitamins and you can see their nutrients and hormones, all of these vitamins and minerals are cofactors that are required for mitochondrial function. All those enzymes require cofactors. In addition, they require hormones like thyroid hormone, hydrocortisone, testosterone, etc. Now, after the food is broken down and the electrons and protons are stripped off of these food molecules, energy is made. But just as you burn wood in a fireplace and you get heat and light, you also get waste products called ashes. In the case of the metabolic system, we identify these as free radicals. And they're actually needed. It turns out that free radicals then regulate the metabolic system itself. We use free radicals to destroy bacteria, for example, in little units called peroxisomes. But at times, if we're not burning fuel efficiently, we will spin off too many of these free radicals and then we will get damage to our cells, damage to our mitochondria themselves, damage to our DNA and damage to fatty acid membranes, which are the structures that hold all of the fluids and, and cellular components together and act as barrier between different compartments. 
Now, at the top of this slide, you'll see the word decreased oxygen utilization. This is actually the central issue in sickness. As we age, we become less and less efficient at breaking down food in the presence of oxygen. We don't notice it at first in our 30s and 40s, but then you start noticing when you're on a treadmill that you just can't go as long. And actually, I could go into some more detail about measuring oxygen uh, use and carbon dioxide output by actually putting a mask on a person with a computerized setup, and you can show that even at age 30, we're already losing efficiency and burning fuel in the presence of oxygen. Well, when that happens and we make too many free radicals, we start to have more free radical damage there on the left. And at the same time, to diminish our free radical antioxidant systems. This then leads to decay of the mitochondrion and decreased repair of these little furnaces and finally aging and disease. And this becomes a vicious circle that at some point in time becomes identified as a disease like cancer, heart disease, autoimmunity, et cetera. Now here's a close-up of the mitochondrion and I'm giving you a lot of this chemical background. I don't mean to be too detailed, but we're going to get into the fun part to see on a practical level what this means shortly. Now at the top there, you can see glucose. Glucose is the preferred molecule to burn in, in the mitochondrion with oxygen. Uh, however, we also need to burn fatty acids. And if we can't burn fat, you know what happens. We accumulate it. When we use a lot of glucose in our diet, you can see towards the left that we make a lot of insulin. And insulin, remember, allows you to transfer the sugars across the glucose transporter into the cell and on into the mitochondrion. But if we get too much glucose, we start to make it into fat. And in addition, we need insulin to move the sugar. And every time we eat more sugar, we make more insulin. And eventually, insulin starts stimulating fat storage. Worse than that. It, stimulate, it, it blocks the breakdown of fatty acids. So now you're accumulating but not breaking down, and guess what? You're now becoming very dependent on this glucose utilization in the mitochondrion to make energy. And at that point, you're making very inefficient metabolism called fermentation and making a lot of acids. And acids then further damage this whole uh, oxygen transport and utilization system. If things work well, our fatty acids and glucose are made into this substance called acetyl coenzyme A, which is nothing more than a derivative of vitamin B5 pantothenic acid, and from there enters a Krebs cycle and finally into a thing called the electron transport assembly. And that's really the business end of the whole system that allows you to make ATP. So in fact, if your electrons aren't flowing properly, just like in any kind of electrical system, the system becomes sluggish and finally breaks down. Now, these free radicals are actually self-generated wastes from burning fats and sugars. They're not evil. They're only evil if you can't neutralize them. Now, we have been taught by the medical profession and even the government and certainly the pharma industry that somehow we doctors have caused people to live very much longer than they used to. You'll hear stories like, oh, people used to live to be 30 in the caveman day. This is simply a fabrication on the part of the medical profession. The truth is people lived to be old uh, long ago as they did today, but infant mortality which mu was much higher. And you could go to cemeteries in Wisconsin and see that often you'll see four or five children in one family having died before the age of five. If children live to the age of five in such times, they usually live to be 80 or more years of age. They just die for different reasons, and we'll get into that. Now, this is some historical data on this. We're, we have these epidemics of disease, cancer and heart disease, right? And the doctors say, well, they had them all the time. It's just that doctors weren't good at diagnosing it. So you've got to wonder when we weren't quacks and on, you know, when was it that we became so bright at diagnosing things? Osler, who we worship as the founder of internal medicine, stated 
that the cause of heart disease was infection. This was in 1908. Remember this, all in the last 100 years. Paul Dudley White, President Eisenhower's doctor, graduated med school in 1914 and saw only two cases of coronary heart disease. He stated that, quote, until the first two or three decades of the 20th century, coronary heart disease was rare, and get this, and not missed by ignorance. He's putting the lie to this idea that we were missing things. This is the same story they're telling us about autism. Oh, it was there. We just didn't have special ed departments. This is just another fabrication. It wasn't there. I know in my class, I know what kids, especially the boys, that were problems. And we didn't have ADHD. Yeah, it's, uh, a lot of this is food. Third, Dr. Herrick first described heart disease resulting from hardening of the arteries in 1912. So with that backdrop, let's look at some actual data as to how we arrived at an epidemic proportion of heart disease as well as cancer. And here are some photographs of people living in ancient times when they actually had to work for their food and all of their food was organic whole food. Evidence of this kind can come from various sources, and I give another lecture on Paleolithic nutrition where we go into a lot of detail about this, but basically we're going to skip bogs where we can find uh, humans that have been dead for 500 to 2,500 years, and you can look at their stomach contents and know exactly what they ate. And archaeological data, which uh, over in the Wisconsin Dells, we had an archaeology student uh, actually dig a site that showed, in fact, that our native peoples here were using squash and corn and beans, and of course, fishing and hunting. And finally, historical documents that we won't talk too much about it, but if you want to read something interesting, read Tacitus's Germania, a description of the Germanic tribes and what they ate and how they lived in about the first century AD. But today we're going to look at analysis of hunter-gatherers. And I think we're missing a slide here, and it's unfortunate, uh, or maybe not. Uh, there were a couple of MD amateur archaeologists who wanted to know about what did people eat, and they accumulated a lot of data on Paleolithic life and compared the nutrients, the estimated nutrients, to what we're getting today and what the recommended daily allowance is. Can you see this one in the back? Good. And I just want to direct your attention to the magnesium line down there, about two-thirds down. We estimate that people ate or took in about 700 milligrams per day, and our present recommended daily allowance is 350, and we get about 250. Ladies and gentlemen, if this was the only change that occurred in human nutrition, we could explain the epidemic of diseases. Magnesium activates 80% of the enzymes that we were talking about in the mitochondrion. The other one to look at is the very bottom one, fiber. 50 to 100 grams a day in ancient times. The RDA is 25 to 35, and we're getting on average about 10. This also, because of its effect on the microbiome and the consequences therefrom, could explain much of the disease of today. This is the missing slide. Sorry, this is the slide. Who, who has ever heard of Weston Price? Oh, good. Then you know the, it's actually the picture of the frontispiece of his book. Dr. Price, as you know, was a dentist who wondered why we had such rotten, crooked teeth and native peoples he had heard didn't. So he and his wife traveled around the world, and I mean around the world. I don't know if you've ever read his book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, but it's awesome. He went to South Pacific Islands. He went to New Guinea. He went to Peru. He went to coastal Indian tribes in California where people led the old life, and he found about 2% of the people had cavities. And even with one generation, here's a young lady who has very nice white teeth, free of decay, and in the same society, uh, only a few years later, you wind up with this type of uh, mouth, and uh, this uh, was documented over and over again all over the world. And the commonality was people who ate whole, real foods did not have dental caries. Now, there's further evidence. Now, even the regular scientific profession is starting to say, gee, 
maybe sugar and diet has something to do with the disease. Now, I take the journal Science. It's a weekly journal from the AAAS. It's one of the most prestigious scientific academies in the United States. And in this particular article, the authors talked about the evolutionary theory of dentistry. And it uh, discusses the amount of sugar eaten and the amount of tooth decay. And here, this ancient Egyptian had healthier jaw and teeth than most living people. And then he shows a uh, mouth from a German jaw from the Middle Ages that uh, had already been exposed to sugar on a massive scale. And that's a whole history of Alexander the Great bringing sugar to Europe from his exploits in India. Now, the conclusion of this article in Europe, ten, less than 10% of individuals had cavities until he, Alexander, brought sugar to Greece in the fourth century before the Common Era. Uh, cavities increased first in Greece, then Rome. Their incidence also rose throughout Europe in the Middle Ages, but the biggest spike was 1800 to 1850 when Britain took control of the West Indies and imported far more sugar. Sugar helped fuel the Industrial Revolution, which was transformation from agricultural-based economy to a machine-based economy. Notice the historical milestones. 1800, 1850, sugar starts going this way. And then we get into the other things, like making grain into uh, uh, white flour, basically, hydrogenating oil, and on and on. There's actually more than enough explanation for the epidemics. Now, this is a, a, an actual study of Victorian times. We hear that, oh, it must have been just awful living in the 1800s, right? Well, how the Victorians worked, ate, and died. And this study went into great details. Luckily, we have countries where people kept very good epidemiological records. In, in England at that time, doctors did, on average, three autopsies a week. And they did very careful examination and recorded their findings. And we're going to get into what those findings were. And here you can see the Victorian time on the left, the top uh, band, are other diseases, uh, and that would be accidents and unknown causes, etc. But what I want to focus in on is the bottom, the black there on the left, and the black on the bottom of the second graph on the, towards the right are cancers. Now, remember, I told you they were autopsying almost every patient, and only two percent of them had cancer in 1880, and now close to 30% of us or more die of cancer. Now, do you think this could possibly be a genetic disease? If there's no other proof at all, it's this proof. It's food that's changed, and the environment, of course. So, what happened? I think earlier one of the speakers mentioned food-like substances. The uh, change to these food-like substances from it for, from our ancestral diet caused a rapid degeneration of health, as it did to traditional people that adopted our lifestyle. So, to summarize the actual changes, the uh, milling of flour with a steel mill versus uh, stone mills happened around this era also. So a lot of these things converged, you see. With a stone mill, you can only get the flour down to whole grain flour and very coarse. So it has a large surface area. The digestive juices have to work very hard to get it into small enough particles to digest. With the steel mill, the chaff and the germ is split off and, of course, used to feed the hogs and whatnot because that's where the nutrients are. And the flour, the endosperm, is ground into very tiny particles that act virtually as sugar in their ability to be digested and absorbed, and therefore releasing insulin, and therefore making people insulin resistant, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I won't go through all these in a big way, but of course the steel milling coincided also, again, with the great amount of sugar eating, the changing of oil by hydrogenation. You learned about trans fats earlier today. And at the same time, reduction in the omega-3 fatty acids and, of course, when you do the milling of flour, you lose the fiber. And you also lose the vitamins and minerals and the plant pigments. 
The other aspects of this are uh, the change to new wheat. Now, what about this new wheat? Uh, somebody said, oh, we're supposed to eat all this whole grain. Well, first of all, 98% of the flour in this country is white flour. So I don't know who's eating all this whole wheat bread. Uh, there are some people doing it, but you've got to really work at it to find it. Second, wheat has been around probably for 10,000 years, and the original wheat is called einkorn, and then it was hybridized with other wild critters and became known as emmer wheat in Egyptian times, and then various other hybridizations occur, again, not by genetic engineering, but by hybridizing and working uh, to sort for uh, desirable traits. Well, in about 1960, somebody got the idea of injecting genes into uh, wheat to make it, uh, in many ways, different, easier to bake, high gluten uh, flour. Also, uh, rather than having two chromosomes, uh, one from mom and one from dad wheat, they multiplied the genome up to eight chromosomes. So that, that was a way to make lots more gluten to make it more bakeable. And finally, the starch has been changed to an amylopectin, which basically becomes instant sugar. So now we had wheat that contained new alien proteins that we have never experienced before, and another whole lecture would be how it's so difficult to digest gluten. Gluten is a big spherical molecule that has big chains of, of cysteine residues that are very hard for enzymes to grasp and cut. So you wind up with a 33 amino acid sequence called a 33 mer that has been shown beyond any question to cause inflammation in the gut lining, leaky gut, and then the whole rest is history causing autoimmune disease. And finally, parts of the gluten are digested into five amino acid chains called exorphins. They're called exorphins to identify them as identical to endorphins, which are native hormones, opioids, that, are, that we make in our brain to make us happy and to kill pain. Well, each time we eat this type of grain, if we're not digesting it totally, and it's very hard to do so, we are actually giving ourselves a fix. So you wonder why people, I remember going to the Greek restaurant, and they have these white, crusty loaves, and uh, you know, you could actually eat the whole thing. I mean, it's very, very addictive. So. This brings us to what happens when we start losing control of our sugar uh, metabolism. And there's no such thing as borderline diabetes. Some people are now calling it borderline, but it's really a matter of progressive loss of control of glucose and consequent glycosylation, and we're going to learn about that, damage to body proteins. So how does the sugar uh, in the blood lead to the damage we see in metabolic syndrome? When elevated sugar occurs over time, it gets hooked onto your proteins. This is a process called glycosylation. And over time, these become advanced glycosylation end products. It, there becomes more and more alteration to these molecules, and they finally become, and these, these are scientific terms now, rages, reactive advanced glycosylation end products. These are the ultimate destructive inflammatory molecules that lead in metabolic syndrome to arterial sclerosis, kidney failure, nerve damage, and retinal disorders. And by the way, it's now clear that high insulin and insulin resistance is also heavily correlated with all cancer. So this goes across the board, and, and I didn't say, but in Victorian times, the rate of heart disease death was like three or four percent, and now it's 30. So we traded accidents and pneumonia and bad water and whatnot for modern diseases, which we brought on ourselves by farming and other practices. So this means that the above person is not turning that glucose into energy, but instead storing it as fats and attaching it to protein and causing malfunction of those proteins. Back to this mitochondrion, just to review, if we're living on glucose, which so many of us are, we're making a very acid molecular environment. We're needing to continue to replenish this glucose in order to have any kind of energy at all. And then we're getting insulin resistance, storing more fat, and progressively becoming so insulin resistant that our pancreas then stops making insulin. Now, I can tell you as an aside, I have had patients, they come in on large doses of insulin, and it's still not working. And I say, you know what? You should quit all this insulin. 
and let's see what happens. And guess what? You take them off of all carbs and take them off of all insulin and their sugar comes down. We're taught that in some cases the pancreas may have worn out. I have even seen cases where it appeared to wear out, but if you still take all the pressure off by stopping this glucose uh, entry, those cells will renovate. By the way, type 2 is nonsense. It's not a disease. It's bad food, loss of minerals, and, lo and no exercise. It's nothing more than that. So this is a slide, again, hard to read, and it's from the Journal of the AMA. I love to quote the AMA because once in a while, an actual factual piece of material enters their journal. And I don't know if the editor may be sleeping that day, but this is a, a wonderful study done at a university hospital looking at people's brains with functional magnetic resonance before and after a dose of either glucose or fructose. And it turned out fructose turns on reward centers in the brain and not only doesn't let you become sated, but accelerates your need for more, whereas glucose turned on areas that made you know that you've had enough to eat. There was a decided difference between glucose and fructose, and here are the author's conclusions. And this is just this year, January of 13. Compared to gluc with glucose ingestion, fructose ingestion attenuates increases in circulating levels of satiety enzymes, glucagon-like peptide, and does not attenuate levels of ghrelin, an appetite-stimulating hormone. In their conclusion, thus, fructose possibly increases food-seeking behavior and increases food intake. Uh, I had a slide that said that this was addiction, pure and simple, and I don't think, I think all of us know that it's addictive and that when you start eating, especially this high fructose stuff, you want more. Now, this is sort of a, a summary of a, diseases of aging and uh, the idea that it starts as a decrease in fat metabolism. What I didn't mention earlier, when you burn fat or sugar in the mitochondrion, 60% of the energy is made into heat. You're warm-blooded, right? and 40% into ATP. So tell me, people that come in and say they're tired and ache, they always say that they're cold, almost all of them. And that's because their mitochondria aren't working and they're not making heat. So the reason why the fat is not being burned in the mitochondria is because there's too many carbohydrates, as we mentioned. And also, indeed, there's too much stress, hormone deficiencies, lack of exercise, some genetic elements here, probably about 5% of it, and I was trained as a geneticist, so you know what? That's a story, another story that genetics, all genetic problems. And finally, obesogens. These are molecules that have been talked about extensively today. Uh, farm chemicals and bisphenol A and other organic compounds that act as obesogens. They actually make insulin resistance worse. So we're really fighting against a, a big group of forces. And then again, modern wheat. And then there's specific factors that inhibit the chemical pathways in the mitochondrion. And these include heavy metals of all kinds, excess iron, that's a big interest of my practice. If you don't have a serum ferritin measured by your doctor, you don't know your iron status. They'll say, oh, your iron's okay. They mean that your hemoglobin's okay. It's, there's just no other way to know it. Uh, and then, of course, all the ones that you know about, pesticides, herbicides, pharmaceutical drugs. I read an article from Poland where the authors reviewed how drugs of all categories affect the mitochondrion. And after I read the article, I said, I'm going to have to go back to the office and become a naturopath and quit prescribing drugs. Because virtually every category of drugs does something bad to your mitochondria. And then solvents, vaccine components, uh, free radicals, and all the plastic and industrial chemicals that we're all exposed to. Now, so what do we do about this? There's a guy named Dr. Brednisman. He's a neuroscientist, and he was trying to figure out for the last 25 years 
how he could understand Alzheimer's disease. And he would come home and talk to his wife, who was also a physician, and say, honey, you know, we're finding out that the beta amyloid pleats, if they're folded in just the wrong way, it causes an autophagic reaction, which eventually results in an apoptotic phenomenon and neural degeneration in Alzheimer's. And she says, yeah, oh, that's interesting, honey, but you're going to find out it's all about DESS. And so they're going back and forth. And then a few years later, very recently, Dr. Brennisman said, you know, honey, it is all about DESS. And we proved it up, though, how it worked. And that's exactly what it's about. It's just too simple, isn't it? And by the way, this is the food pyramid of the Waters Integrative Health Center. Maybe we'll get a bigger one later. But on the bottom are vegetables. And the next one are animals. And the next one are fruits. And the next one are cereal grains. And then finally, real oils and honey and maple syrup. An artist friend of mine did that with me to, uh, and I've sent it to the president and other people, and I've had absolutely no replies or interest. <laughs> so there's another big piece of this. It's not just what we eat, but it really is about movement. I don't believe that any of us in this room have had to engage in an activity even remotely similar to this to gain our daily ration. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. Well, it's stuck. Um, anybody know anything about these things? Hmm? Hit back? It was this one that would make it go, but it doesn't. This arrow? Just, well, you have to use the mouse, but just like click with the mouse. You're already on the next slide. Okay. But, like, to okay. Can you, can you go like, back to the other one? Or is yeah. this was this the next one? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And yeah, go ahead back to the next one, the, the one that you just showed. And so yeah, uh, that th this goes to show you. This is a lithograph from the 17th century showing native peoples in the Southwest USA uh, bringing the uh, harvest to the larder. So you not only had to catch your prey but you had to haul it and store it in some way. Uh -oh. And so here's another study, this one from... Really? All right. So the, the idea of exercise, in, in the past, we had to go fishing, we had to go work on uh, the garden, we had exercise built into our routine. There was no such thing as like, oh, do you want to go jogging? It's like you wanted to like rest when you didn't have to work your butt off to get what you needed. So here's an article about active lifestyle boosts brain structure in older adults. Can you imagine this? It says here that an active lifestyle positively influences brain volume in older adults with or without Alzheimer's disease. And this was again done with magnetic resonance. Improving lifestyle could reduce the risk for Alzheimer's by 50%. Now, anyone knows in, in this room knows what it costs to house in a nursing home an Alzheimer's victim can imagine what this means. 50% resulting in 1.1 million fewer cases in the United States. In the United States, the lack of physical activity is the number one most powerful lifestyle factor causing Alzheimer's disease. So this is pretty important, and that's one of the hardest things. Food, getting people to change their diet is hard enough, but getting people to like move, especially once they're older, and it's never too late. You could take a 90-year-old person and in one month's time double their fitness by just getting them in, involved with weightlifting and whatnot. It's a whole variety of reasons. Exercise causes a relief, release of nitric oxide, which is a signaling molecule that improves the function of that endothelial lining. And, and yes, indeed, just simply getting circulation, lymphatic circulation, removing toxins, there's a whole bunch of reasons why it works. Now, the cousin to that little mitochondrion guy, she's a lot better looking. She's a chloroplast. 
And this is really where the action is. This is where light interacts with carbon dioxide and makes glucose using magnesium as the central atom in the chlorophyll molecule, which is very similar to the hemoglobin in our cells, which is an iron chelate. And there again are those colors, but we're going to see some colors that are more important to us uh, in our everyday life. This is another uh, artist concept of a cell with signal, uh, with receptors on the surface, and they're a little hard to see, but these are receptors for food items. And here we see this, the, uh, the it blowed up, and, and it shows here specific molecules in T, ECGC in the upper right, binds literally onto the surface of the cell, as does sulforaphane from broccoli or allicin from garlic. And when it binds there, it sets into motion a series of transduction signals which result in our DNA being activated to manufacture antioxidants, different types of regulatory molecules against cancer, detoxification molecules, and anti-inflammatory compounds. So literally curcumin and ECGC are part of your system. You need only ingest them. And I, I met a man a few weeks ago, Stig Bengmark, uh, a Swede, an MD, PhD surgeon, just a marvelous guy in his 80s, and you'd never know it. And he has been, he got interested in the microbiome and food and whatnot about 30 years ago. And uh, he talks about the, the best way to stay healthy is have a smoothie in the morning. And he and his wife have one with kale, avocado, and broccoli. And if you do anything different, start to take a, a blender, and you don't have to juice it, just drink the whole thing. Lots of vegetables. Now, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the microbiome, and I suppose we're almost out of time here. Um, anyone heard of the microbiome? Well, it's the germs that exist here in your gut. Well, it's actually starting at your mouth and all the way through you. And they number 10 times the number of cells in your body. And they make all kinds of molecules to help you. They make coenzyme Q10. They make B vitamins. They make short-chain fatty acids that feed your brain. They make bile salts that help you metabolize fats and actually have receptors in your brain. And here's an article again from JAMA, and it talks about the benefits of these intestinal microflora can help our health by breaking down toxins, synthesizing vitamins, defending against infections. But get this, they also play a role in such diseases as peptic ulcers, diarrhea, colorectal cancer, and inflammatory bowel disease. You're going to hear a lot more about the microbiome. And here's an article about obesity in the microbiome in which the authors indicate that, in fact, the microbiome population controls eating behavior and metabolism. This is monumentally important. It's the most under-recognized so far issue in medicine. It is the missing link to health care that only in the last few years has come to be important in the minds of doctors, and it'll take a while. So don't wait for us. Go to the health food store and make your own sauerkraut. So very briefly, uh, we talked about these metals and poisons, and I'm just going to say there's two ways of getting rid of toxins. Most all toxins can be removed by sauna therapy, and I would encourage everyone to get an infrared sauna. Metals are very well removed by chelation therapy, and we've been doing that for 30 years and have published basic science work on chelation. It's a wonderful treatment. The uh, TAC trial of the federal government last year or earlier this year revealed that, in fact, chelation therapy does help people with coronary heart disease. And also bleeding. Uh, we don't use leeches. They're too expensive. We simply take off the blood. And I'm serious. If you have too much iron, the only way to get rid of it is to bleed those patients. That's why it was done throughout history. And chelation is a concept, it comes from the word for crab in Greek, chile, 
and it means the grasping of an atom, in this case lead or cadmium or aluminum, and the removal of such from the body. Uh, they can be given intravenously. There are some oral agents. And here's an example of what EDTA can do for gangrene. The uh, upper left uh, was when the patient started, and you could see how it's healing. Uh, just a few months later, this person would have lost their legs, and we have uh, helped a number of patients and saved a number of legs over this time. Uh, so all in all, you have to remove toxins uh, and rebuild your body. And you can see there, and th these are going to be on the, the website, and you probably all are pretty familiar with that. Uh, and again, finally, mitochondrial resuscitation, that's where I live in my practice. Uh, that is, I'm thinking in terms of how a person's mitochondria are working, and besides changing diet and contributing the proper vitamins and minerals and fatty acids and hormones to the patient, there are ways to reactivate these mitochondria, and that is by exercise and by restriction of calories, like fasting one day a week, and then these polyphenols that we talked about, these wonderful pigments in our uh, food. And you know, if, if your mitochondria work again, you don't make too many free radicals, but you do make a lot of ATP energy and you feel well and your pain goes away. And here are some of these wonderful pigments in our food. And here's the food pyramid that we created that I talked about earlier. It's really the food pyramid of our ancestry. It's nothing new. And I love this quote, and I think anybody that's been sick can relate to it. When health is absent, wisdom cannot reveal itself, art cannot manifest, strength cannot fight, wealth becomes useless, and intelligence cannot be applied. Herophilus in 300 before Christ. And here's a happy family from Peru. And just look at the variety of actual foods and look at the smiles on those faces. This is what we could all have. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Have you ever used additional oxygen to resuscitate the mitochondria? Uh, Yes, there's a number of ways of doing that. One is hyperbaric oxygen. Dr. Mores has uh, that unit in his practice. Uh, another is ozone, and we are now under a FDA uh, board, uh, investigational review board, to uh, use ozonation of blood, something that's been done in Germany for 77 years. And, and third, uh, exercise itself, but you're talking about with oxygen. Yes, indeed. One can get on a treadmill with an oxygen mask on and breathe oxygen while you're panting, and that does work. It's called exercise uh, while breathing oxygen therapy, and it's very common in Germany where it was developed. And what does that do? It, it does the same as I'm talking about. By exercising, you're putting demands on your metabolic system, and you're adding a lot of oxygen at the same time. So you're getting these mitochondria to, again, jump into gear and start making more energy. And by the way, w the damaged mitochondria are rapidly broken up. There's a process called autophagy. It means self-eating. So we actually break down these damaged mitochondria, recycle the components, and the ones that are still normal then bud and form duplicate copies of these things also have their own DNA and can multiply. So it's just a wonderful win-win by exercising. And the, adding the oxygen just helps. Anybody else? Yes, sir. One question years ago, I was told that DHT I wouldn't doubt that. I know there are preservatives, and I even, some of these anti aging people uh, were saying we should eat BHA, and uh, I, I think uh, that doesn't sound right, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. He said that these preservatives, BHA, and what's the other one? BHT. Uh, actually poison your mitochondria. So maybe that's how they preserve food and stop microorganisms from growing. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
the, the amount of stuff that's added to our food, that's why basically, and, and this, this Stig, this famous surgeon that I was telling you about from Sweden, he said, look, it's all about not eating processed food. It, it's actually just what they say, you know, go in the grocery where there's actual uh, real things and then make sure they're organic. If you do that, your health's going to get better. Oh yeah, that's uh, the electron transport chain consists of five large globular enzyme complexes, but in two positions along that little wire sits coenzyme Q10. So this is a really key player. And in people that are very, very ill, like with chronic heart failure, one might have to give six or even 800 milligrams of Q10 per day. We actually measure Q10 in the blood, and it's amazing how inadequate it is even in people taking it. So sometimes you really have to have big doses. The sicker you are, the more you need, as well as carnitine. Acetylcarnitine would be the second player that are really vital. Yes? Yes, indeed. Like I'm using primarily EDTA to, EDTA binds lead, cadmium, aluminum, arsenic, antimony, nickel, tin. It's not so good at mercury. Mercury's a tough one. Uh, we use a challenge to determine how much mercury's in the body using DMPS IV, but it's rather expensive to use IV and there may be some toxicity issues, so we then tell people to use DMSA, which is a legal drug in this country, and you can get it on prescription or you can buy it as a nutritional supplement. It's quite safe. And then, of course, garlic. Garlic does take mercury out, believe it or not, and get your fillings out. And I must say, saunas also, you sweat out a lot of toxic metals in sauna. So it's not, sauna takes out everything. You, your skin was really designed as a detoxification organ. All right, thank you. Oh, yes, you go, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, you know, Ingo and I have discussions about this. I don't think you need to, you can have chelation before, during, and after you're having your fillings out. That's a story that I don't think has any scientific basis. But I think it's rather stupid to go and do chelation for mercury fillings, for mercury when you have a whole mouthful of this stuff. There's just no possibility that you're going to defeat it by taking chelation. It's just mandatory. If you have the means, that's one of the primary things one should do. Get rid of your mercury fillings. And you had one there. I had a question on, you were talking about the infrared sauna. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts on, like, um, hot yoga, infrared yoga, where you're in a room and I think they take it up to at least 100 degrees. 50% um, humidity. I mean, you're just sweating for 90 minutes. Like, I'm not familiar with it, but I'm sure that would, you know, these are ancient techniques that were designed for detoxification. They're well thought out over millennia, let alone centuries, so I'm sure that it's something very good. It's about sweating, in my opinion. Now, in yoga, it might be doing some other things as far as body positioning or something that I'm not familiar with. Well, that's, that's another question, whether the infrared energies themselves have an impact, a positive impact on health. Because they are photons, and that's another whole story. You're adding photons of a certain frequency, and this accelerates electron movement, which ultimately is what causes all healing. You had one there, Miss? When I've done fasting, for me, it's easier just to drink water all day and just drink it. And every time you get hungry, you just drink a lot of water. And w hunger comes in waves. So, but the other way to do it that I've done years ago is to use a citrus fast, get a bunch of lemons, limes, oranges, and grapefruits, and squeeze them out, organic ones, and then cut it with distilled water and just drink that. And then a third way would to be actually make vegetable juices. You know, the thing is, you're not giving someone that much sugar when you're doing vegetable juice. It's not like drinking soda pop. And so you're probably burning that sugar off quickly, and you're not getting into this insulin 
problem in blocking fat storage. Plus, you're not putting in any proteins, which are ultimately the real cause of this intoxication. Inadequately digested proteins are what leads to immunological reactions when the gut is leaky and these fragments get into the bloodstream. Lymphocytes look at them and say, oh, that's the enemy, and a whole cascade of immunological events occurs. So you're, you're not, when you're doing a juice fast with vegetable juice, there's very little protein in there. And there's lots of fluid, lots of vitamins, lots of minerals. So, it's a diff so e each of those uh, methods are quite good. Well, that's an element of it. To uh, when you take all the heat off an organ, in this case the gut, most people will tell you when they go on a fast after about three days, they feel better than they ever have in their life. I remember thinking that I could actually rotate my head virtually 360, and you 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 start urinating massive quantities of fluid that have been stored up in your tissue because your body's trying to dilute all of this poison that's been accumulating over years. So fasting, remember, is also a tradition in every religious and societal, you know, Indians had sweat lodges, you know, all the Nordic countries and Siberia had these uh, sweat lodges. It's just really, fasting and sweating are the two actual basic healing uh, processes. You're welcome. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>